And God said to Elijah, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And a great and strong wind rent the mountain, but the Lord was not in the wind. In the small town of Barneville, Wisconsin, survivors of a devastating tornado struggled to rebuild their lives. All I remember is like two by fours snapping. It must have been as it was taking the houses behind us. Just snapped like toothpicks, you know. Across the United States each year, a thousand tornadoes suddenly take shape. And those that find targets kill more than 100 people and cause $300 million in damage. But now, modern science is fighting back. And these storm chasers in Oklahoma are pursuing the elusive tornado as never before, daring to get close enough to unravel its mystery, and possibly one day accurately predict and even help prevent its wrath. Tornado, next on NOVA. Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And Allied Corporation, a world leader in advanced technology products for the aerospace, automotive, chemicals, and electronics industries. darkening sky. A brooding cloud drifts over the prairie. It brings welcome rain and cool wind to the dry flatland. This is a thunderstorm, common throughout the Midwest during the spring and summer. Inside is a rising column of air, in this case powerful enough to trigger an unusual chain of events. The outcome? A spiraling whirlwind sucking up everything in its path, swelling, becoming a swirling mass of debris. For the public, tornadoes are vicious acts of nature, appearing suddenly and striking arbitrarily, leaving in their wake death, destruction, despair. March 18, 1925. The single most destructive tornado in history brought devastation from Missouri to Indiana. 700 killed, 11,000 homeless. More recently, April 1974, the largest outbreak ever. 148 tornadoes swept across the Deep South and Ohio Valley in just 16 hours. From Huntsville, Alabama to Xenia, Ohio, 335 died amid $600 million in damage. Historically, man has been at the mercy of the tornado's uncontrollable wrath. But human ingenuity is finally catching up, and a new kind of battle against the tornado has begun. May 17, 1981. A team of scientists races into the heart of a violent storm. A camera fixed to the top of their van records this remarkable event. Rapid circulation, right overhead. Slow down, Neil. Stop. Rapid circulation. About one half debris, debris, tornado. That's right in front of us. Oh my God. Coming right at us. I got it. I got it on video. Track it on video. Roger, uh, Conrad, I think. Spring in the Midwest, four years later. The same group of scientists has come together in the vast flatlands of Texas and Oklahoma, where visibility is good and conditions produce the most active tornado weather on Earth. They're part of the National Severe Storms Lab in Norman, Oklahoma and they call themselves storm chasers. Day after day, they work in teams. Among them is a pair of graduate students, Lou Wicker and Lance Rothfuse. Their goal, to track down a tornado and put a portable weather station directly in its path. Built to withstand violent weather, it can sense and record what no human can approach without real danger. Watch that wire. Don't let that wire get pinched in there. The Totable Tornado Observatory, affectionately nicknamed Toto. Yeah, this is 
In charge of the intercept program is Bob Davies Jones, one of the world's leading authorities on tornadoes and their parent thunderstorms. I've been chasing since 1974 and seen about 40 tornadoes. And we spend like 200 hours out in the field looking for tornadoes. To be a chaser, it takes a lot of persistence and a lot of fascination. You really got to be in your blood. You really got to get a thrill from going out and watching nature perform. Also watching is veteran tornado chaser Howard Bluestein, professor of meteorology at Oklahoma University. This year, Howie and his team seek clues to how tornadoes form by releasing weather balloons into the pre-storm environment. Balloons are an old tool of meteorology, but out in the field, they're ideal for studying thunderstorms. To me, a, a severe thunderstorm, like a giant piece of architecture in the sky, provides me with a sense of awe and wonder. I've always been interested in uh, severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Most of what is known about tornadoes has come through work of this kind, going out year after year to observe and collect data in the field. The chase teams depend on their own eyes, but they are backed by an operation that makes use of the newest and most advanced weather technology, Doppler radar. The National Severe Storms Lab is testing Doppler for use in issuing tornado warnings around the country. Here is a powerful set of new eyes guiding chasers in the field. Doppler radar allows them to probe inside thunderstorms and see the spiraling wind patterns that may lead to a tornado. Yeah, it still looks pretty good. Working directly with chase teams is lab meteorologist Don Burgess. All of the elements must come together for our knowledge to increase at the rate we wish it. We at the Doppler need to know what the chase teams see in the clouds to give us reference to those measurements we make in the wind field. So we've learned to work very closely together to learn the most we can about the storm. And to do that, the chasers have only a short season, from April to June, when tornadoes erupt along a notorious strip of land known as Tornado Alley, stretching from Texas up to Iowa and Indiana. They look for storms along two weather boundaries. As spring turns to summer, Thunderstorms commonly occur as warm, moist air rushes up from the Gulf of Mexico and collides with a front of cool, dry air from Canada. The second volatile boundary is what scientists call the dry line. It forms as dry air spills onto the plains from the Rockies, butting up against and flowing over moist air from the Gulf. The dry line is a natural laboratory for studying thunderstorms. It's very dry and warm to the west of the dry line, and usually the air clears out uh, just to the east of the dry line. So one can go to the dry line, see a thunderstorm, and get in the exact position that you want to be relative to the storm. So the dry line is where the chasers focus their attention. They look for potential instability, a contrast between moist air near the ground and dry air above it. As the day wears on, the sun heats the moist air, which starts to rise condensing and forming clouds. But it's kept down by a layer of warm, dry air above, which forms a cap. Along the dry line, colliding air masses often push the clouds through the cap, and storms explode into the upper atmosphere. In severe thunderstorms, rising moist air can reach speeds of 100 miles per hour and heights of 60,000 feet. As the updraft weakens near the top, cloud material settles into the upper level winds and spreads out into an anvil. Strong and sustained thunderstorms known as supercells are sometimes 20 miles wide at the base, the anvil covering half a state. A small fraction of these big storms interact with winds moving through their environment and rotate as they grow. They are called mesocyclones, the birthplace of the tornado. Trailing down rope-like from the storm, a tornado is usually destined to die as abruptly as it appears. The strongest can be a mile wide and stay on the ground for over an hour. Winds swirling into their base can exceed 250 miles per hour. No other natural phenomenon produces winds this strong. 
For the scientists who chase them, tornadoes are mysterious, awe-inspiring, even beautiful. On one unforgettable day in 1981, the chase team saw nine tornadoes. Oh, what's it like to see a tornado? It's an incredibly exhilarating experience. The first tornado that we saw on 22nd May 1981 formed and dissipated in the classic style. It began as a whirl of dust underneath the wall cloud. Soon the condensation funnel began to form and then connect with the dust whirl. The tornado assumed a rather sinuous or elephant trunk type of shape as it went across wheat fields. In fact, there were times when the red dirt from the fields were sucked up all the way to cloud base and the tornado was just enshrouded in a, uh, a red cylinder. It's a display of nature which is extremely rare, extremely violent, something which not too many people have seen. It's very fleeting. Getting this close to one of nature's most awesome performances is an amazing accomplishment. Over a possible range of 125,000 square miles, the chasers wound up here at precisely the right time. The morning of May 12, 1985. The first stop for the chase team is here at the lab, where weather data from many sources are pooled together. It's possible that what we'll do is we'll get an occlusion, dry line coal for an occlusion down on the border is happening. The graduate students, guided by Bob Davies Jones, become detectives. They piece together clues that might tell them exactly where, within their 200-mile range, tornadoes may appear later in the day. The Doppler system can see a tornado about 20 minutes in advance, but the chasers must gaze hours into the future so they can be there when the action takes place. Ah, I'm scared about going south. The stuff that the wave lifts north. It's a long drive. Several miles away at Oklahoma University, Howard Bluestein and his crew are making similar choices. For Howie, this is a fascinating process of weaving together the atmosphere's intricate and sometimes obscure patterns. We'll move off to the northeast at 35. Intercepting severe thunderstorms is partly a science and partly an art. We know we need potential instability, moisture, but these conditions often persist over broad regions. The trick, and I say trick, is to try to determine over what localized regions will the severe thunderstorms actually occur. At this point, forecasting becomes somewhat of an art. People who look at weather maps day after day after day notice that certain events seem to be correlated with the formation of severe thunderstorms. What I like to do is take some of this art, noticing that there are certain relationships in the weather map uh, between certain features and the occurrence of severe weather, and then, after the fact, going and trying to determine why uh, these features are related to severe thunderstorm activity. Good morning. We have an interesting severe weather situation developing today. Also on May 12th, the same large-scale weather patterns are being monitored at the National Severe Storms Forecast Center in Kansas City. The strong subtropical jet runs across Texas, and the polar jet comes across Kansas and Iowa. The job of these meteorologists is to predict severe weather anywhere in the continental United States and alert the public by issuing a watch. Right now, they notice an explosive situation in Tornado Alley. In this satellite image, the red shows a sharp contrast between moist air near the ground and dry, cool air above it. The atmosphere is potentially very unstable. Tornadoes could form anywhere along a 300-mile dry line, running from Oklahoma City down to Wichita Falls and Abilene, Texas. The question for the chasers is how far south to go. The answer in Howie's mind, not far at all. His plan is to watch for storms just south of Oklahoma City. I so. I checked the room. Did you hit the auto light? But if storms become severe down in Texas, he wants to be in position to go after them. See, the thing is, I think our winds are back slow. Leaving shortly afternoon, Lou and Lance have committed themselves to going south all the way to Texas. The entire year's research depends on data they collect in these few short weeks. But this season, tornadoes have been fewer than usual, making the race against time and distance even more critical. Negative, we're, uh, from, uh, uh, no, 
Conditions change so quickly, the teams need to stay in contact with the lab. Within 50 miles of Norman, they communicate by radio. But once out of range, they're forced to pull off the road and just use the phone. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about something happening uh, right back uh, just south of Norman. We're seeing a little uh, towering queue and small seabees building up under the anvil from the Wichita Falls storm. But uh, the echo development is still weak. I don't think that's anything that would command that you turn back and head back into Oklahoma. I think you should still head southwest toward the Wichita Falls storm. Okay, I think that this activity here uh, appears to be going downhill. And if anything does come up from uh, southwest of Wichita Falls, we'll have plenty of time to get it. Okay, Howie, well, good luck. Thanks, bye-bye. What are we doing? We're gonna go west. It, it's still not exactly clear what's happening. Thunderstorms are breaking out southwest of Wichita Falls, and the weather service is considering uh, putting out a watch. When Howie learns that storms have started to go up in Texas, he decides to move a little further south. The situation in Oklahoma doesn't look promising. Still, his instinct tells him, stay close to home. Yeah, go west in 29 to Marlow, and then we can drop okay. south to Duncan, and we can be in good position for any storms that are popping up down here. But I still don't have that much faith in it. How far southwest of Wichita Falls are the thunderstorms? Archer City. That's not very it's off the map here, but it's about 30 miles from, from Wichita Falls, something like that. It's where the last picture show was filmed. Actually, yeah. Three twenty-five p.m. In Kansas City, the Severe Storms Forecast Center issues a watch for northern Texas. Yeah, it's Fort Worth. This is Kansas City. It seems that the uh, development around Abilene is going to become severe soon, and we probably should issue a severe thunderstorm watch. And what we have uh, indicated here is a watch that extends 60 miles east. And if west dangerous weather materializes, it's up to the local branch of the Weather Service to warn the public. Lou and Lance are heading for the watch area, hoping to get Toto there in time. They make a quick decision, gambling on a shortcut to Wichita Falls. For storm chasers driving long distances over unfamiliar roads, the risk of getting lost is ever present. Are you looking southeast or southwest? I'm looking southeast. West. West. Southwest, Lou. No, I'm looking over there. That's southwest. We're going. No, to... isn't it east of the road? The road goes southwest. We're going south right now. What are you saying? That's southwest. That's southeast. This road goes southwest. This road. Hold on, Bob. South. I've got a, a direction oh, problem 65 here. going south. We're not on 65 yet. Yeah, we are. Yeah. 4.30 p.m. Howie is still in Oklahoma, about 70 miles from the lab and 50 miles from the Texas border. Look he spots a cloud that has broken the, uh, through the cap and is widening at the base. It could be the start of a thunderstorm. Of that tower. We have somewhat of a dilemma right now. We're right along the back side of the deep moisture. Uh, we've been measuring the temperature dew point outside the car. You can see the edge of the clouds right over here. The towering cumulus cloud went up and uh, looked very good. Looked as if it might become a thunderstorm, but then it uh, died. We also have a thunderstorm way off in the distance to the southwest, somewhere near Wichita Falls. And we really don't know whether that particular thunderstorm is getting the deep moisture or not. But what we really need to do right now is to get a telephone, call back to the lab, and find out what the storms to the southwest look like on radar. Hello, Oklahoma City. We are uh, seeing development of severe thunderstorms across the Red River into Oklahoma now. And we think that the activity will develop towards Oklahoma City and so we propose There's now a tornado watch that includes both Oklahoma City and Wichita Falls, Texas. It's 7 p.m. Howie must commit to one of these options. New cells are forming right along here. They're just not very well organized. And I'm going to try to see whether or not any of the storms which we passed by to our west earlier are, uh, are coming up. Tornado watch. Howie learns from the lab's radar that the Oklahoma storms are still weak while the Texas storms continue to build. Let's go a little bit further. Let's get suckered a little further southwest. He has reached the point of no return. He must go south or risk seeing nothing. Air 
The Toto team crosses into Texas and gets set for intercept. Lance, you need to get both Nestle two cameras out of the uh, silver case back there. Okay, we're a couple of miles uh, for the city intersect here, 79 and 70. Okay, Roger, we're crossing the Red River. Okay, we're right behind you, 200 yards. Howie's team is moving for the clear air at the rear of the storm, the best place to see a tornado if it forms. But to get there, they must travel through a curtain of rain and hail. You're coming to downtown Wichita Falls? Five, two, eight, Even one, with south. the uncertainties of forecasting severe weather, the teams are within minutes of the largest storm in the watch area. Uh, what about taking 287 South Key? But there is no guarantee that it will produce a tornado. See what I'm looking at here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the clear air behind the storm, Howie's team searches for signs of rotation, right now, no the mesocyclone that may produce a tornado. If one were to form, it would form somewhere over there about three miles away. But the right ingredients have just not materialized. Yeah, I get out. Several miles away, right underneath the storm, Lou and Lance are in position to deploy Toto. Whether or not a tornado appears, they risk encountering the greatest danger to storm chasers, deadly lightning. If it's gonna do anything, which I'm not so sure it's going to, it's about 30 to 40 minutes away. So we need to position ourselves 30 to 40 minutes from now. And I would guess, it looks to me like it's almost- With the team still in Wichita Falls, radar at the lab picks up strong storms near Oklahoma City. The information is transmitted to the weather service, which issues a tornado warning. Radio and TV stations alert the public. Southeastern and eastern sections of Oklahoma County, also hail. Goodness gracious, would you look at that? You're looking live from our tower camera. Between 8 and 9 p.m., three tornadoes were sighted. One tore through a trailer park, but no one was killed. For the chasers, the day has been a frustrating one, but not unusual considering they only see four or five tornadoes in an average season. It's very difficult to observe severe thunderstorms. So you need to go out for many years and make many observations and look at the various types of phenomena which can actually occur in nature. So it requires an incredible amount of hard work, perseverance, and it does get very frustrating. As the chase teams face a long drive home, their real work is just beginning. Back at the lab, they'll study the conditions that produce tornadoes in Oklahoma, but fail to in Texas. We think we understand and we predict pretty well the large-scale weather, the movement of large weather systems across our country. And we understand some of the mesoscale weather, a smaller scale, uh, the size of the watches that we issue for tornadoes, maybe part of the state of Oklahoma. We know severe storms will be in western Oklahoma today. We're able to predict that in advance, but it's very hard for us to predict where a tornado will be exactly, which square mile of ground it might affect later today. That micro scale information, we're going to have to learn more and do a lot of development, increase our skill as scientists to understand those details. As the scientists move closer to their goal of predicting severe weather on the local scale, real world forecasters still face a monumental problem. The Weather Service is set up not to see the details, but to monitor the enormous volume of atmosphere across our country's landscape. The weather stations they rely on are simply too far apart. At the Severe Storms Forecast Center, satellite data and new computer systems are helping to fill the gaps. And the accuracy of tornado watches, the first step in alerting the public, has improved. But there's still a long way to go. The problem of such large-scale predictions was underscored on June 8, 1984. A tornado watch was posted for all of southern Wisconsin. Most people in the small town of Barneveld treated the stormy night like any other. It was really windy all day. And I remember sitting in the living room, talking to Mom, watching TV, and saying that we're really going to get a storm because it's so windy. And it was just windy all day. I never got out here during the night. 
uh, we got about three quarters of the way out here and we met a young man from out in this area and he said don't go out there he said it's all gone and i said what do you mean it's all gone he said it's all gone well, i said what about the church he said it's flat just before 1 a.m a tornado roared through town 90 percent of the homes were destroyed nearly half the 500 residents were injured nine died I had to work early the next day, so I went to bed like about nine o'clock. And it was start, you know, it was windy out then. And then Laura woke me up about 9.30 and said that there was a tornado watch out until, I think she said 11 or 12. So it's a big deal, we've had him before. Michael was already in bed with us that night. And um, Matthew was in his bed. And both the boys shared a room. And um, Matt cried, Matt started crying and stuff because he, I don't know, apparently they've already been, always been afraid of the thunder and lightning, especially in the middle of the night. So uh, we took, I went in and got Matthew and put him in our bed and um, laid him down and then I went to the bathroom and we had a bathroom right off of our bedroom. And before I ever got done, I could hear the houses, I could hear the houses and stuff crashing behind us. I ran out and told Charlie to grab Michael and go to the basement that there was a tornado coming. And I've never been in a tornado before in my whole life. It was the loudest crash of thunder that I'd ever heard. It was kind of strange because normally in a thunderstorm, you, know, you hear the wind blowing or you hear the rain hitting against the side of the house. And all of a sudden it was just dead quiet. It was uh, the most sobering quiet that I had ever encountered. And then the next thing you know, there's a roar. And the roar didn't give you any time to react. I thought for sure that a jet plane was going to crash. There was a real peculiar kind of a pressure. The pressure was so great, it's it almost like the house expanded and then almost came back together again. The next thing, I, I was knocked to the floor and debris started flying. And of course, at that time, as soon as that happens, you think right away, tornado. All I remember is like two by four snapping. It must have been as it was taking the houses behind us. Because I remember two by fours snapping, just snapped like toothpicks, you know. You could hear two by fours snapping and, and glass shattering. So all I remember is running, running down, just running for my life is all I could do. And I couldn't, you know, I knew she wasn't right behind me with Matthew and I, I didn't think I could turn back because I had Michael with me and to, to go find him or we'd all be up there, you know. So I just ran down to the north wall and I, Michael was kind of wrapped, hanging around my neck and I just kind of put him in front of me and, and put my elbows right up against the cement wall and then it was over with in a few seconds. And As soon as we stepped off the main foundation of the house, that's when it hit. That's when the door hit. That's how Matthew got killed. A bolt off the doorknob went to the back of his skull right next to his brain stem and killed him instantly. How I knew that he was very seriously injured and stuff was, um, I was leaning forward and as soon as it was done, I leaned backwards. He kicked my legs up from underneath me and rolled on my back and that's when he gasped for air. When I heard my wife screaming, I made my way over to her by exiting off the back of the foundation. And her comments to me were, I don't have any clothes to wear and why it struck me immediately as a tornado, I don't know because I'd never been in one before. But I simply told her, I said, Barb, there's been a tornado and we've got to get over to the fire station. I got her off the, off the foundation and we started heading toward the fire station and of course we had no shoes. And as the lightning once again lit the sky and guided my way, I looked at the fire station, I just thought, my God, the fire station's gone. After the house was gone, I set Michael up over the cement and we walked around and got Susan and, and and Matt, we never, you know, all I said to her is we gotta get out of here. We don't know if it's coming again or what. We gotta get the shelter. So we just picked them up and we started walking down the street. We had no clothes on to speak about our underwear. I could see Charlie and Sue and they had Matt and Mikey with them. And, and uh, Charlie had Matt and he, he said, take Matty, he's really hurt bad. There was five doctors that worked on Matt. 
And um, I knew by the time he ever got into the ambulance and left that he was already dead. I remember the rain, cold, cold rain just poured. Dark, it was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, except for when the lightning would flash. And then you could look down and you could see every house was gone. That's all you could see is, as we walked down the street, every house was gone, just flattened. The Bonneville tornado was a quarter mile wide, its winds swirling at an estimated 250 miles per hour. Some died as their homes collapsed on them. Others, like two-year-old Matthew Ashelman, from flying debris. When a tornado this size hits a town, it becomes a churning mass of flying wreckage. This test footage shows just what debris can do. The wind by itself is enough to tear most ordinary houses apart. It can easily lift a weakly connected roof from the house. The walls then lose their support and the entire structure collapses. But a low cost reinforcement of the roof to wall connection using a simple metal clip can make all the difference. It's commonly done in hurricane regions, but because of the tornado's erratic nature, rarely any place else, even Tornado Alley. To better understand how debris acts in tornadic winds, engineers at Texas Tech University have recreated the tornado's destructive power in the lab. With a unique kind of gun, they will fire this 2 by 4 at 115 miles per hour, the speed it might be hurled in the strongest tornado. Their target? Various kinds of walls. Is the chamber clear? Even sturdy Ready? brick ones. Three, two, one. They've learned that no economically built wall remains intact. Based on these tests, they designed an impact-resistant shelter that can be built into a closet. But the battle against the tornado involves not only protection. All right, Dale, that's a tornado drill. Open the door, please. Everybody stand up. Public education becomes increasingly important as scientists move toward a better understanding of tornadoes and more accurate predictions. Throughout Tornado Alley, students are taught to move downward, away from glass, and no matter what, to stay indoors. Go to a basement, a closet, even a bathroom where plumbing strengthens the wall. Hit the wall! The value of public awareness was made clear in April 1979, when a mile-wide tornado struck Wichita Falls, Texas. Some 6,000 homes and apartments were destroyed. Yet among the many thousands who found shelter in their homes, only five died. Tragically, 26 died in their cars, many of them fleeing the storm. The Barneville tornado struck in the middle of the night, too suddenly for anyone to prepare for it. But the very fact that people were in their homes may have prevented an even larger toll of death and injury. A year later, the town has been rebuilt but there remains a shattered sense of security. It's not one thing happened. <laughs> it's not like that, it's everything happened. You know, your business is gone, your town's gone, your school's gone, just your house is gone, everything's gone. Part of your family's not here anymore. And there used to be so many kids out here, now afterwards there's no hardly any kids anymore like there used to be. <laughs> there used to be a slug of them, because some moved out, some moved to other towns, and just a total change, I guess. Before, we really never even had any alarm come into our lives at all when we heard of a tornado watch. But now, of course, when we hear the word tornado, it brings up a whole array of pictures in our minds. And my dreams in the first three months were never of tornadoes, but of utter confusion nothing ever came out right. And I think that was what people had to live through. They had nothing under control. When it gets nasty, I get scared just like, you know, really bad when it's a lot of lightning and it's windy. And it's kind of like that night started out. And I get nervous watching, watch the clouds and, and the old heart's going 90 miles an hour and I'm right at the top of the stairs wondering if I should go down and it's scary. 
I think that's the biggest thing that happened for this whole community. Their, their sense of well-being, of safety, was blown away, literally. Um, they're vulnerable. We found that the parents were really having as much trouble, if not more, than the kids were. Kids tend to express it. Parents tend to try to be strong. Parents would say, I want us all to feel fine again, so let's just not talk about it. And I know from a counseling standpoint that it's important to share and talk about it and to get it out. Across America's heartland, towns like Bonneville live under the shadow of sudden and unexpected disaster. To make matters worse, tornado warnings are plagued with false alarms and chronic lateness. On local radar, the Barneveld storm looked like any other. Only after the tornado was reported did the weather service issue a warning. And by then, rescue workers were already pulling people from their destroyed homes. If the public is to be warned of tornadoes reliably and further in advance, weather technologies will have to be updated. About the time of World War II, we learned that we could take a beam of radiation, send it out, bounce some of it off of raindrops, get it back at a receiver and measure that power amplitude. And that's what we have with conventional radar. This system shows us how heavy the rain is. If we're gonna get one inch of rain or two inches of rain from a thunderstorm, but it's hard to use that information. And this is the way we've been since about the time of World War II to say, where is a tornado going to occur? With a Doppler radar, we get the exciting new prospect of seeing the winds and maybe rotation up in the storm that might produce a tornado. This new radar is based on the Doppler effect. If the wind is moving away from or toward the radar, the signal will bounce back at a different frequency. The greater the difference, the greater the speed of the wind. When we look at the Doppler display, it becomes much easier to see areas of circulation. All of the red colors are flow away from the radar. The green colors are flow back toward the radar. And right at the center, there's a very dramatic color shift. We have a little red in the green and a little green in the red. Together, these colors show a signature for rotation. Right in this The area, tornado's right signature on the Doppler screen was discovered as a result of Chaser's observations. In May 1981, this strong tornado was tracked on radar and followed by chase teams near Binger, Oklahoma. And on the Doppler radar analysis, there was a small anomaly. It was not known for sure that it represented a tornado, but by going back and getting the times of the chase team's observations and the places where the tornado was along its path, so what would look like a glitch in the data turned out it correlated exactly with where the tornado was. So it was the signature of the tornado. She's bubbling. What do you have? Yes, it's firing along the edge. A year later, for the first time, the Weather Service in Oklahoma City began using Doppler radar from the Severe Storms Lab to issue warnings to the public. There is now a plan to install these advanced radars across the country. The system is called NEXRAD, Next Generation Weather Radar. It will cost about a billion dollars but it could help reduce the huge costs exacted by severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. 500 lives and as much as a billion dollars in damage each year. Mike, Ed, I've got a warning for you. Dick, uh, you might try to get a hold of OHP, Stillwater PD, this is Oklahoma City weather. We're issuing a severe thunderstorm. Energy radio, WR5, AW, this is station. Persons in Covington, Enid, and Breckenridge are in the path of these storms and should be prepared for large hail and high winds. All right, we're putting it on the air now. Doppler radar helps with warnings on thunderstorms in several ways. First, it increases the lead time. With our conventional system right now, without Doppler, lead time is maybe zero. The tornado is formed before the warning occurs. With Doppler, we can get an average perhaps of 20 minutes lead time, time for people to take shelter. Also, the warnings with Doppler are more accurate. There are many fewer false alarms, perhaps 50% fewer false alarms. That will allow the public to have more confidence in the warning, and they will be more likely to follow through and take those precautions that might save their life. Here in Boulder, Colorado, is an experimental forecast center of the future. If tornadoes are ever to be predicted more than minutes in advance, it will be at weather stations like this one. Okay. The thing we were worried about is getting this 
Using a network of closely spaced observation posts, meteorologists here monitor the subtle atmospheric changes that may be associated with severe weather. They employ all the newest sensing technologies, including Doppler radar. And powerful computers allow them to display and manipulate information as never before. This image from 1884 is the first photo ever taken of a tornado. Historically, the subject of endless myth and speculation, tornadoes were once thought to cook potatoes in the ground, even fuse coins in people's pockets. A recently published idea held that tornadoes drew spin from vehicles passing on highways. More credible theories have had to do with electricity, hail, even the Earth's rotation. If you have a tub of water and you let it still for um, maybe two days, very carefully remove the plug and then let the water drain out. And it's been shown in the laboratory that you will get a vortex which has the same sense of rotation as the Earth. A tornado would require about three hours to form by this mechanism, and they seem to form much more rapidly than that. Out of systematic observations made in the past decade, a body of new theories has emerged. The mystery of the tornado is being reduced to a few key questions. It would be awfully nice to release it and track a sounding right along the dry line right now. And then the convection gets... One of the basic questions we ask ourselves is why don't all thunderstorms rotate and why don't all those rotations or mesocyclones produce tornadoes? We need the right ingredients in terms of moisture, buoyancy, and the wind forces together to make rotation. And then there is a very, very delicate balance to get that ro rotation to spin up into a tornado. We find that the environment, the near environment of the storm, makes all the difference in the world. Scientists now understand that thunderstorms gain rotation from a special combination of winds moving through their environment. Describing how these winds are organized is one of Howard Bluestein's goals in a unique set of experiments along the dry line. What's the temperature? Uh, temperature looks to be about uh, 33 Let it go. Okay. His team releases a weather balloon. While it radios back information to a small computer, chasers track it to determine wind profiles. And we were located right now. How's the signal? The signal looks just fine. A little windy out here. In particular, they look for wind shear, a condition in which the winds increase with height. Surface winds are slowed because of friction with the earth. While high above, the air moves faster along a narrow, high-speed river of winds, the jet stream. Now imagine that you have a wind which is coming from this direction down here and a wind coming from this direction up here. The wind's coming much, much faster up here than down here. Imagine what would happen if you put a paddle wheel in the air. It would start to rotate like this. Strong wind here, weak wind here. It would begin to rotate. Now, meteorologists call this measure of rotation vorticity. When wind shear is present, rotation pervades the atmosphere, like countless rolling tubes of air. The growing thunderstorm tilts the spinning air upright, creating two vertical vortices, one on either side of it. The storm builds into the area of the counterclockwise or cyclonically spinning vortex and starts to rotate. What happens now is that air will rise into the cyclonic part of the couplet and the vortex tube, if you will, becomes stretched. It stretched vertically and it shrinks in scale horizontally, very much like a skater who's spinning around. The skater brings their arms in and they spin up. That by itself is still not enough to produce a tornado. This can produce what's called the mesocyclone the rotation within, the strong rotation within the thunderstorm. At this stage, as the mesocyclone narrows, the cloud base lowers into a beautiful and imposing form, the wall cloud. But here, the mystery deepens. Out of the rotating wall cloud, the tornado seems to form suddenly, without warning. What unseen events trigger the tornado? Some of the answers are appearing in storms, not over Tornado Alley, but in a computer at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Scientists here simulate mesocyclones to see how and under what conditions they may produce tornadoes. 
as the radar scan the storms and the chase teams are uh, taking observations underneath these storms, they are obtaining extremely interesting observations. On the other hand, with our numerical model, we can obtain complete data sets. And if our comparisons with those observations show that we're simulating uh, realistic storm features, then we can use that data to further understand the important mechanisms within these storms. After it reaches maturity, the computer storm produces features seen by chase teams, a wall cloud, and nearby a clear area where downdrafts break through the cloud base. This is the same computer storm in horizontal cross sections of five miles, two and a half miles, and 800 feet above the ground. Downdrafts occur when dry air flowing around the storm at mid-levels is cooled by falling rain. The airflow patterns here suggest that downdrafts help create a new source of rotation that ultimately leads to the tornado. Here we see the moist inflow uh, approaching from the east and the downdraft outflow spreading out behind the storm. Where these two airstreams collide, we see a strong convergence line which separates these two very different air masses. This produces very strong rotation about a horizontal axis, which is then tilted into the vertical and strongly intensified in this low-level updraft, which we believe is responsible for the strong rotation which ultimately produces the tornado within the storm. The mesocyclone continues to rotate, but within it, this new rotation causes rising air to move faster around a tighter spiral. In a matter of moments, it turns into a funnel building down from the wall cloud toward the ground. The storm is now sucking in large quantities of air through the tornado's base, causing fierce ground-level winds. In most tornadoes, the updraft is constrained to the single funnel. In a strong tornado, the airflow may become so unstable that the funnel breaks down into a series of smaller vortices. For storm chasers, the computer model has created a lot of excitement, for it gives them a new way to test out their ideas and observations. For example, downdrafts were first noticed in the field, and the computer helped make sense of them. This is a spectacular wall cloud. Look at the, uh, look at the striations, the multiple striations in this, and if there's any large hail, Near the end of the 1985 season, Howie sees a kind of storm that seems to produce tornadoes without a strong downdraft, indicating that there are probably other mechanisms at work. We'll just have to do our best. It's going to move right by us. So far, I've been very impressed at how many storms, which look nearly identical to the one we saw yesterday, actually occur in nature but aren't documented. Uh, secondly, we'd like to get soundings up near these storms uh, so that we can uh, uh, simulate these types of storms using the numerical model uh, given the environment that was measured by our, our balloon. Okay, release. Okay, 1910, 30. Okay, okay. Clear. no problem. Good, no problem. Right up into it. Absolutely excellent. Okay, five seconds to go. The balloon is going perfectly. Tornadoes present the greatest challenge to severe storms forecasting. Many scientists believe that accurate predictions will eventually be made an hour or more in advance. Tornado, tornado, I think we have a tornado. I don't know, okay. But they also realize that understanding the tornado fully will come only at the end of a long, hard battle. strong outflow in that region. But there's a vortex tube along the gust front in your face. That is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Wait a minute, it doesn't have good rotation. We're not going to deploy. For scientists, getting even the most basic temperature, pressure, and wind data can be highly dangerous. This year, when Toto was deployed in a tornado's damage path, it was the first time that direct measurements of this kind were ever recorded. You have the cyclone data? That's right. I don't know whether it's... Then we deploy back down. We leave everybody here, except uh, the crews. Um, let's deploy back down the road. Let's move it. Let's go. 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 Let's go
moving west. And deploy Toto. Right here, Steve. Somewhere in here. Somewhere in here. Somewhere in here. Toto's about to be deployed. Time is 19.02. A little farther, Steve. A little farther. Peak the hill. Peak the hill. Hopefully, the effort of these scientists will unravel the mystery of the tornado and help prevent the death and destruction that so often follow in its wake. In Barnevel, the one-year mark approaches. A single house remains to be torn down. Most people have rebuilt their homes, new trees have been planted, and businesses are starting to return. It's hard to know how much is going to happen in a normal year and how much is special because this year this community was almost totally destroyed. Uh, one of the things we've seen was an unusual uh, amount of depression, of sleep disturbances, um, of several instances of people being suicidal several instances of people being so stressed that they were hospitalized. However, in, in looking back on the crises of the past year, I believe that now people are pulling together again. The depressions are lightening up. People are sleeping through the night a little better. The wind doesn't scare them quite as much. They're piecing it back together. Uh, but all you can do is just uh, forget about what happened and try to go on, you know. No matter what you do, it isn't going to change anything. So, basically, that's all you can do, you know. Try to forget what happened and start over again. Everything I lost could be replaced, and there were families in town that lost members and that they can't be replaced. So I'm very fortunate in the fact that I, my insurance company was very good, and now I have a new home and new furniture, and got all my kids with me, and we're all going to be okay. Optimistically, I'll say I'll rebuild my dealership, and optimistically, I'll say I'll rebuild my home. I guess there are some emotional reasons why I shouldn't rebuild. The pessimism comes from, do I want to be here? I can look to as many people as I want, but the answer has to come from within. I don't know if I have the spirit to rebuild. Jim Kennard finally did summon his spirits, and he began to rebuild his home and business. How have you personally been able to do it, you and, and your wife? That. Start over again. Try to try not to forget what happened, but try to put it in the back of your mind and keep stumbling ahead. That's all you can do. Is there something that the rest of the country could learn from what's happened here? Don't give up. Uh, thanks very much. Your last name is spelled A. A S H L I M. -A. I'm sorry. Could I hear, just hear that again? Just so we make sure get, get the spelling right. A-S-C-H-L-I-M-A-N. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm sorry to bother Later in the summer, Sue Ashelman gave birth to a baby boy. The wounds here are healing. Some of these people are even going to help others, victims of a violent tornado in Pennsylvania. Most people in this village are just happy to be alive. Elijah go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord and behold the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord but the Lord was not in the wind God is not in the earthquakes in the fires in the winds of this earth for those forces seek to destroy 
What more do we need to know? Amen. We raise our voices in thanksgiving. We are thankful to be alive for our faith, our sense of community and belonging, for our persistent, patient, and passionate God. And we remember Matthew Specialman, Rick Hammerly, Kirk Holland, Bruce and Jill and Cassie Simon, James Whitby, and the helicopter pilot, Sergeant Stuart J. Searle. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to Nova, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Please be sure to include the show title. Major funding for Nova is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by Allied Corporation, a world leader in advanced technology products for the aerospace, automotive, chemicals, and electronics industries. And the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. To purchase film or video copies of this program for educational use, call toll-free 1-800-621-2131. In Illinois or Alaska, call Collect, 312-940-126. Local presentation of NOVA is made possible through a grant by the Phillips Petroleum Foundation, Incorporated. Coming soon on OETA, gain a new understanding of an important event, the return of Comet Halley. Scientists believe that the left hemisphere of the brain specializes in language and speech, the right in shapes and patterns. Yet some have suggested that the delicate balance between the two halves of the brain can actually be shifted by the language we speak or by the hormones that make us male and female, changing, in effect, the way we think. The divided cortex is the subject, next time on The Brain. Tonight at 8. Coming up on Live from Lincoln Center, she's opera in our time. She wasn't born a princess, but her life on stage has made Dame Joan Sutherland the reigning queen of opera. Be there as Dame Joan sings Donizetti's Anna Bolena, the story of Anne Boleyn in concert. Expect the royal treatment on Live from Lincoln Center. Monday evening at 7. Take a look at the room you're in. And above all, at the man-made objects in that room that surround you. The television set, the lights, the phone, and so on. And ask yourself what those objects do to your life just because they're there. Go ahead.
The summit brings a slight thaw in U.S.-Soviet relations. Tonight's top story on Washington Week in Review. Ford Motor Company, worldwide manufacturer of automotive products, has provided funding for this program. At Ford, quality is job one. Additional funding is provided by Ford Aerospace and Communications.